Welcome everybody to Exploring Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary 2020. Today's live program is the program New Life After Tragedy, Exploring the Shipwreck Portland. I'm Hannah McDonald, the Education Specialist with NOAA's Office, Nas Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And I'm here today in the Inner Space Center at the University of Rhode Island. On screen today, you're going to see me, you're also going to see the research team in Situate, Massachusetts, and you will also see an ROV feed coming from underwater in Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. Now, earlier today, that ROV feed was coming to you in real time live. That would be the 2.30 program if you were able to catch that. Unfortunately, due to changing weather, they had to pull the ROV out of the water. So any footage that you'll be seeing from underwater during this 6.30 program has been pre-recorded, but will still be of the shipwreck Portland. 
That being said, our normal model is called a telepresence model. It's when we stream a ship's underwater feed to the scientists ashore and include viewers like you all to take place in scientific exploration. Now, this is so important for today's, during today's national health crisis to continue doing research in a safe manner. Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries are leaders in ocean science and exploration. They're committed to continuing this work, but also committed to keeping their staff and research partners and all of their families safe, following the local, state, and federal guidelines. That being said, I'm here in mission control all by myself. I have my mask for when I will be interacting with the production team, but when I'm all alone, I wanna share my smile with all of you. Also, the team in Situate, they are all outside, standing far apart from one another, so that they can also share their smiles with all of you. As I've mentioned, all of you are included in this program. I wanna highlight that you can type in questions, comments, anything you'd like to share into the comments, feed the questions box, or any engaging way across the platform that you are watching on. That being said, I wanna welcome Maritime Gloucester, the Maine Historical Society, and Norwell Public Schools. These are three groups we know are tuning in right now, but I wanna know where all of our other viewers are from. So as I run this next video, that's going to tell you a little bit more about today's program and the past exploration and the exploration that happened this summer, I'm going to have you type in where you're coming in from and we'll report out after this video plays. 842 square miles, up to 600 feet deep. The final resting place of hundreds of shipwrecks and one of the top 10 whale watching destinations in the world. Located 25 miles off Boston, Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary is home to a rich assortment of marine life, including Atlantic cod, haddock, flounder, bluefin tuna, and many species of whales, including the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale. Stellwagen Bank also contains vast numbers of shipwrecks, ranging from wooden sailing ships to modern fishing trawlers. These wrecks are both windows into the past and important habitats for marine life. Stellwagen Bank Sanctuary is one of 16 marine protected areas within the National Marine Sanctuary System, a network of more than 600,000 square miles of underwater parks. Managed by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the sanctuaries promote responsible, sustainable use of ocean and Great Lakes resources. To foster the public's connection with the ocean, NOAA awarded funding to Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, often referred to as HUI, to conduct state-of-the-art research. Based on nearby Cape Cod, HUI is the world's oldest and largest nonprofit ocean research and education institution. In 2019, tools and technologies pioneered by HUI and their partner, Marine Imaging Technologies, let us share high resolution images and interact with viewers in real time. This year, those same remote tools allow us to carry on our work during the pandemic. In early March, we added innovative microwave technology that beams data to shore, providing faster communication and better images. And we adapted our research model to include a smaller crew at sea and broad distribution to partners on land. COVID-19 has changed many aspects of our lives, but with careful preparation, social distancing and technology, we can safely continue researching the ocean floor and sharing our discoveries in real time with you. Awesome, thank you all for tuning in and letting me know where you're from. We have people coming in from all across the country, from Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, all the way to Alaska and everywhere in between. Thank you so much for tuning in. 
So that feed where you dropped your location at, that's also where you can type in your questions to our research team at any point throughout the broadcast. We'll open it up for Q&A once more before the large Q&A portion at the end of the show. So if you have a, a question, type it in now and we can address it then. I'm now going to turn it over to Ben Heskel, the Deputy Superintendent for Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. Ben's going to tell us a little bit more about the history of the Portland. Hi, Ben. Hey, Hannah, and good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight for this, um, what might be the final uh, return to the wreck of the steamship Portland, at least for this year. Uh, we hope to come back some other year, but, um, what I'd like to do for a minute is orient you to what the wreck is is like uh, using this model. Now, this model is of what she looked like during her heyday uh, before she sank in 1898. So what you can see here is that she was a side paddle wheel steamer, about 291 feet long, about 65 feet in breadth. And... Um, and she was a beautiful uh, sort of palatial coastal steamer at the time. But um, what this does not look like what she looks like now on the sea floor. So everything from this deck level up uh, is gone and was removed during the sinking and storm process that she got, uh, uh, she sank in. So um, what, what's left is the base of these uh, smokestacks here and the walking beam is still uh, standing and upright. Um, the side paddle wheel um, paddle wheels are deteriorated and, and almost gone. So um, that's what uh, you will be seeing or uh, you'll uh, see on, on your screen right now. Um, so last year, uh, what we did was we took the ROV and went along the port side and came around the stern and up the uh, starboard side a little bit. And then we uh, got images of the uh, walking beam area. And, um, and this year, uh, we've been able to uh, image pretty much the entire wreck, including uh, this side, with, uh, uh, which revealed a large uh, trawl net here on the starboard side. Um, and so we are using these images to um, actually build a 3D model um, of, of what she looks like now. And you'll see that later in the program. Um, so we know that, um, we know that the Portland um, went down the, the morning after um, Thursday, uh, the, thurs the Thursday after Thanksgiving. Um, and we know this because of um, her location and the tides and the currents that were um, existing at that time. And so we were able to backtrack um, and uh, researchers from uh, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution assisted um, uh, a shipwreck, the discoverers, Arnie Carr and John Fish, in uh, finding her location. And so they were able to determine that there was in fact a shipwreck down there of about this size, um, and, but they weren't able to actually uh, positively ID here. So in 2002, um, I put together a mission uh, it, with the help of the Undersea Research Center at UConn, and we um, put down a side scan sonar and a remotely operated vehicle and we're able to acquire some diagnostic um, features like the twin smokestacks, the walking beam, her overall length, and identify her as the Portland. Um, so um, the, um, the people on board during that horrible storm um, were, were probably just absolutely frightened to death because the ship was getting overwhelmed and torn apart by these gigantic ocean waves. And eventually they swamped the vessel and she sank and went to the bottom and now sits there upright on her, uh, on her keel. Again, everything from here up is gone, but she is sitting upright 
And we know from the images that we've gotten that the, the walking beam still stands uh, on her stout oak A-frame that you see here. And the base of the smokestacks are, are still there. Um, and as I said before, we, uh, we discovered some trawl nets on the bow and on the starboard side of, of the wreck. Um, so, uh, I, um, you know, investigating these historic resources like the, the Portland, which is our most iconic wreck, is an important mission of Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary as well as uh, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Um, and wrecks like these or historic resources like these are important time capsules and they tell us a lot about our past and how we, um, how we were able to uh, conduct business back then and what tools, what technology we used and how we interacted. So these are important resources that uh, are important to the nation and important to our maritime past. Um, so at this point, uh, I wanna introduce Dr. Calvin Myers, who is going to help us interpret uh, what we're seeing through the ROV uh, and through this feed that you're seeing on your uh, TV. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to Calvin. Thanks, Ben, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, um, hello, everybody. I'm outside of the Marine Operating Center here for Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary's headquarters in Situate. And as Ben was talking about, uh, as a maritime archaeologist on this project, one of my goals is to use our technology and the advances that um, are available to us to really go down and dive the Portland and try to understand what happened, uh, maybe to the walking beam and to the engine as well as look at the artifacts and reconstruct those uh, final moments of uh, the passengers and crew on board the vessel. And one of the biggest tools that we have and we're putting together is a 3D model through photogrammetry. And 2019, we, uh, we reconstructed portions, but we still had pieces to go. And on your screen, you'll see the model as it's coming up, you'll see the trawl net uh, the, that Ben was talking about. We spin around, we're facing the bow. And these are all composite of high definition video that is shot by Pixel. And what you've just seen is painted in the current data that we collected this year, the actual hull on the starboard side as we're flying or painting down and further nets that Ben was mentioning. As we go along, this is the paddle wheel guard. This is Sponson swooped out gracefully to protect the paddle wheels as they were working. And we get into a debris field just aft of the paddle wheel where we can see um, artifacts and you'll start to see cups and bowls and a hoop and even more we go further in we're actually going into the heart of the shipwreck here this is the walking beam that ben mentioned it sits 30 feet high like an a-frame like a, uh, a eiffel tower in the middle of the portland with a seesaw diamond shaped walking beam that goes back and forth pushing down on one side a uh, piston that's 12 feet, a 12 foot stroke going into a cylinder, moving these paddle wheels 15, you know, 15 knots, trying to fight against this brutal storm on the night of November 26. And we look at all of these features and wonder what happened. Can it tell us anything? Well, one theory was perhaps that the connecting rod from the uh, diamond shaped walking beam was broken. Well, that wasn't the case, but what we found was there was a crank arm, this little, kind of like a bicycle uh, spinning uh, part of the pedal had broken off indeed. And maybe that's what caused it on the port side. Maybe that port wheel stopped and it spun and came down. Or perhaps it was a secondary cause and maybe it ran out of fuel. So right now, or earlier today, we had our smaller robot, the PPE, nicknamed Taz for its whiny noise and ready to go in to take a look inside and underneath the decks to, at the coal bunker to see if there was coal still available. We haven't had the images yet. They were just out last night and this morning working hard getting new data and talking to our ROV pilots as I pulled up at the end of the night with a crimson red moon and Evan Kovacs was describing they saw some pipes and little pieces and they realized they were the first people to see this since 1898. And it's always that sense of discovery because what you're really seeing are the essential workers, the people that we have 
come to realize in COVID and the pandemic are so important and are taken for granted. You don't see them when things are going well, but such as the engineer, Hugh Merriman, or the, excuse me, the fireman, Hugh Merriman, the chief engineer, Tom Merrill, uh, and the people that those passengers would have turned to for comfort, such as Eben Houston, who was second steward and was on board helping doing anything he could. And what's been really exciting for me is that uh, there was a report that his family was on board, but that report was inaccurate. His widow was back in Portland, a city that I've grown to know through the efforts of historians like Herb Adams and a descendant of the family of the widow of uh, Eben Houston, Bob Green, who have shown me around Portland and have shown me just how much that city means to them. And what's really neat is that the seal is a phoenix because Portland has been burned three times through its history and has always risen from the ashes. And a golden phoenix sat above the, the, side, the, the uh, paddle wheels in golden signatures with resurgons or a rise. And we are virtually trying to bring the Portland back above the waves. And we're doing that with some of the latest technology that uh, have been out, has been out on the sea for a couple nights now. But we have a package that I believe Hannah has ready for us in the studio to explain how we're doing this and how we're creating these models. Thank you so much, Dr. Calvin Myers. That was a great tribute and storytelling to those that are lost on the Portland. And I do believe that those 3D images that you were looking at are also a fantastic way to bring Portland to the surface. Now, as Kelvin was saying, we do have a technology package that we are going to play that'll show you a little bit more about the remotely operated vehicles that are operating down there and how they got the photogrammetric model. But before that, we are going to encourage you to type in a question for our biologist lead, Dr. Kirsten Meyer Kaiser, who will appear after this next video. So if you have a question related to the biology of shipwrecks or the life at the bottom of Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, please feel free to type it in as this next video plays. Deep sea research and exploration are completely dependent on technology to go where humans can't. At Stellwagen Bank, we use a remotely operated vehicle, or ROV, named Pixel to take pictures and video around shipwrecks. Pixel is relatively small, a fraction the size of deep sea ROVs. But sometimes we need something even smaller to advance our scientific goals, a penetration vehicle. This year, Marine Imaging Technologies built one, the Portland Penetration Explorer, or PPE, designed to go inside shipwrecks. PPE hitches a ride to the wreck on Pixel, then flies off and explores places even Pixel can't go. Looking inside the Portland helps us gather more information about her final moments. PPE's wide-angle, low-light 4K camera captures images from deep inside, where light is often scarce. These same images will let us build a future VR experience based around the Portland. One of our biggest technological changes this year is not underwater, but in air. Telepresence typically involves broadcasting via satellite, or VSAT. But VSAT equipment is large, heavy, costly, and poorly suited to small vessels. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we're operating with a reduced crew on a much smaller boat, the Catapult. We needed a solution that provided real-time communication to partners on land, but that Catapult could still fit and operate. So we partnered with AV Watch who provide high bandwidth communications for the U.S. Coast Guard, Air Force, and Navy. They pioneered a new way of using microwave broadcast technology, pairing small, stabilized transmitters at sea with equally small receivers on land, 
or even on a plane. Their technologies provide high bandwidth data at a fraction of VSAT's cost, letting us send multiple real-time video feeds to our team ashore and helping everyone stay safe. I don't know about you all, but I'm very thankful for that microwave technology that allows us to connect to you. So we've gotten a question through this type of technology from you all for Dr. Kirsten Meyer Kaiser. And that question is, what type of sea creatures exist around the Portland? Thanks, Hannah. Well, on the Portland, the most common sea creatures are things that I refer to as sessile suspension feeders. These are organisms that sit in one place attached to a surface for their whole adult life, and they just filter particles and small animals out of the water column. Examples are sponges, anemones, and hydroids. Those are really common on the Portland. So last year when I was um, sharing with our audiences, I tried to attack that first level of analysis, just what is there. But this year we've used the opportunity to delve into that research a lot deeper. And so I'm able to share the next level of looking at patterns in the shipwreck. And I can tell you that the Portland community is quite stratified. There's a big difference between the top and the bottom of the wreck. At the top, you see all of those sessile suspension feeders, the sponges, the anemones, and the hydroids. They like to cluster on tall structures, such as the walking beam, which is the highest point on the wreck. There's actually a very dense population of anemones up on the walking beam. Further down the wreck, those sessile suspension feeders are not quite as common because their food source isn't so common down below. They want to be elevated to be exposed to the fast water currents that deliver their food sources. So down below, and especially as we've been exploring inside the wreck, we've been able to find a lot more of the mobile predators, things like spider crabs and sea stars that lurk around there. And especially the fish community loves to be down close to the bottom and inside the wreck because that's where there's a lot of kind of nooks and crannies that those fish can find hiding places. Shipwrecks provide a lot of really important habitat that provides shelter and protection. Those fish can be protected from their predators. They can use the structure as nursery areas for their young. And so the shipwreck actually has multiple roles as a habitat for both the sessile invertebrates and for the fish communities that come around them. So it's been very exciting to explore the Portland and see those patterns in the biological community. With that, I will hand it back to you, Hannah. Thank you so much, Kirsten. And I really think that you do a great job of bringing the new life after the tragedy that both Ben and Calvin explained. We are now going to open it up to our question and answer period, where you're going to be able to ask any member of our research team any question you'd like. So please feel free to submit your questions either on the Facebook, YouTube, or website platform through the chat box. All right, I am going to show a question coming from Facebook. This one is for Kirsten, and it's from Lim. Can we use this sponge creature for water filtering and clean up water pollution? That's another great way to bring new life to tragedy. <laughs> that is actually a really good question. Um, I'm not aware of any uses for the sponges that are on the Portland for cleaning up pollution. Bioremediation is definitely something that's being studied as a strategy for polluted environments across the world. But for the specific species that we're finding on the Portland, I don't think that they're used for that. But nevertheless, that's a good idea that we could potentially explore um, in the future. Awesome. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, we have another question coming in through the website, and it's also, I guess, I'll turn this one over to Dr. Kelvin Myers, and it is, what is it like working on a small vessel? Uh, it's close. Um, actually, it's, I enjoy it. I, my trip tradition I grew up in teaching in small vessels and used to teach small boating uh, courses and what's great about that is you rely on your team you become not just the scientist or the archaeologist but you have to work together you get to experience all the facets and you really become a crew so whatever you need to do um, 
whatever the captain tells you to do, you know, you learn and, and you do your best you can at that and you thank them for their patience and instruction. And I think it's all kind of from the top to bottom gives you a better sense of how much work goes into this, not just with the sciences, but well, the broadcast, the telepresence, um, just getting to the site and working underwater, that kind of small team rely on each other and uh, it's one of my favorite aspects of this project really is the teamwork and the team that we have assembled to do this so it's been a blast thank you so much calvin we have another great question coming in from the website from mave and this one i think i'm going to send to ben this is how big were the waves when the portland went down I think this is a great question because as we just noticed, the wind is whipping behind Kelvin, which means that the catapult vessel that's out in Stahlwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary right now is probably experiencing some similar weather. Yeah, it's probably on its way in. Uh, I don't think the weather's quite as bad as it was during that uh, storm of the 19th century, uh, the perfect storm, where uh, the waves were probably 30 to 40 feet high. So just imagine an object that is that high. Um, I'm not sure how many stories that is. It's at least um, like three stories. Uh, so if you can see, you know, this, this model over here, the waves were easily uh, washing over the top deck and, um, and destroying the superstructure and, and inundating the hull. So that's why she sank. And... Um, you would not want to be out in those waves. I agree, Ben. I would not want to be out in those waves. We have a question coming from Ellen on Facebook, and I'm going to throw this one to Kelvin. How do you become a shipwreck diver or researcher? Uh, I get that question. What a great question. Uh, I've had a very uh, kind of a side winding way to get to this but really it starts with an interest in in people in humans and a love of the ocean uh, you combine those two aspects then you can go in there's obviously education and uh, archaeology classes anthropology classes there's a couple great universities that do graduate school uh, so you can go down that path but a lot of the time what we find is people don't have the time and investment to do that and really it's interest i work a lot with citizens citizen scientists who have a passion of history and heritage and understand the importance that this heritage transcends time meaning that it belongs to all of us not just present day but also future generations and if you start with those core ingredients uh, there are programs out there, and um, I am happy uh, if uh, anybody is interested. As I said, we have some public training and um, happy to engage in that. But uh, there are uh, solid, you know, graduate school programs in maritime archaeology out there. And, uh, and if you're serious about doing that, I'd look into it. Thank you so much, Calvin. And we have a question coming from Molly. And this one I'm going to first turn over to Kirsten, but I think it would also be great for Kelvin to address as well. What's the most exciting thing you've discovered on the Portland so far, and what do you still hope to find? The most exciting thing I think I've found on the Portland so far was um, earlier this summer, we were able to collect some specimens of common species on the wreck. And um, using dissection in my lab and by comparing those specimens to taxonomic keys, I was able to identify one of the sponge specimens that had been really tricky um, for me last year. And I actually identified it to a species that is most common off the coast of Europe and had not previously been documented as far as I know, in the sanctuary. So that was a pretty cool discovery that there's a sponge species that's thriving in these deep, cold waters that is usually only found on the other side of the Atlantic. So that was pretty neat. And what I'm still hoping to find is honestly just characterizing the patterns in the communities, learning how shipwrecks function as habitats. And um, throughout the rest of the fall, I will be reviewing the footage that we've collected this summer and using that to compare to the older previous years of investigations and describe how the shipwreck has changed over time. I'm really looking forward to doing that analysis. So uh, Hannah, for me with, with this, it's a small 
uh, hidden kind of intimate artifacts that we've seen. One way to think of the Portland isn't just a ship, but it's really a floating hotel. And so all of the activities that come along with the hotel, people sleeping, people eating, working. And what we found just this year uh, was in the back, there was an area for the women to go to have their own privacy and talk amongst themselves. And it was the ladies' salon. And in this area, we found uh, what I thought at the time was a second evidence of a second galley, but it was actually a warming stove that they could bring the food back. And you can see the plates and cups. And it was um, it was right on some decking. It still hung. And below the decking, you saw some parts of the ship where it had fallen away. And it was, had this very haunting cathedral like uh, sense where you're walking in and you're seeing a flying buttress and you feel this moment preserved in time and right outside of that we found a sink with the faucets and on the ship plans that we looked at with the models that was right where the washroom was and in fact there was later we saw and going over the film the toilet bowl was hidden underneath so sometimes not the most glamorous things but these are things that always attract me because they're very relatable and they're very human and those stories are um, really what the Portland's about because those events happened every day. Yeah, that's awesome, Calvin. And it's great to see what artifacts can tell you. We have another great question that I'm going to send over to Calvin again, and it's from Liam. And he wants to know a little bit more about what you may have found with the artifacts, but whether or not it was equipped with a radio to telegraph distress. Uh, Liam, great question. So it sank in 1898 and it ha didn't have a, a radio or a way to get the stress out. In fact, part of the mystery is what happened. It was last seen at 11 p.m. at night by another passing uh, vessel going the other way, going for a safe harbor. And it was struggling against the waves, according to the report of that captain. And as Ben mentioned, what we know is that it struggled for the next 10 hours fighting and struggling against insurmountable odds. And, and I have this moment, there was a moment last year where I was standing out on deck and I realized that they made it through the dawn. And while they couldn't give out a message to people on land, I have to believe that when you get to the dawn, there was some hope and they were fighters. So we, we don't know what happened at those last moments, but we know that they kept trying. And I think that has a lot of lessons in there. So thank you for your question. Yeah, that was a great question, Liam. We have another question that I'm going to throw to Kirsten, and that, that is, has this wreck become a hotspot for invasive species? I actually get that question a lot because I mention that, you know, species live on wrecks that we don't find on natural hard bottom habitats. But as of right now, I can tell you that there are no invasive species on the Portland that I have found. And I'm relatively confident in that. We do know there is one invasive species that we're a little concerned about in the sanctuary. It's called Didemnum vexillum. This is a peach mat that just overgrows and smothers everything. Um, there was a moment earlier this summer where I thought we had found some on the Portland. And so I asked our ROV pilot to zoom in a little bit and it turned out to be a sponge. So as of right now, no invasive species on the Portland, and I was very excited to find that. Awesome. And we have another question for Kirsten, and that is coming from Adam. Does a Rex structure on the otherwise empty seafloor provide a hotspot for biodiversity? The answer is yes. And that is statement right there is the very foundation of my research. This is a habitat that is not supposed to exist by definition. There is not supposed to be a ship there. And so it leads to all sorts of interesting questions of how did the organisms get here? What were they doing out in the middle of the mud um, when they happened to come across this wreck? What does this mean for the connectivity of populations? And we can also use wrecks as an opportunity to study how those species interact with each other. So yes, wrecks absolutely are hotspots of biodiversity. They have that dense colonization that you just don't see on the soft bottom habitats. And uh, that fact alone opens up so many interesting research questions. That is awesome. And it does directly relate to your research. Yes. We have a question coming for Ben. And this one is, what does the Portland mean to the sanctuary? And what does a, having a sanctuary mean for the Portland? The Portland is the sanctuary's most iconic historic wreck. Um, 
and part of our mission is to understand the uh, cultural and art, uh, historical um, resources of the sanctuary, document them, uh, to uh, interpret them and tell the stories to the public like we're doing right now. Our other part of the, our mission is to understand the natural uh, biodiversity of the area that Kirsten just uh, spoke about. Um, so the Portland um, is just, you know, uh, a very important um, iconic shipwreck for us and uh, is telling us a lot about, uh, or we're learning a lot about our, our past uh, from the 19th century and um, how we um, used technology and and how we interacted with each other, how different classes interacted with each other. Um, and so um, uh, I think, what was the other part of the question, Hannah? The other part of the question was, what does having a sanctuary mean for the Portland? So <clears throat> the Portland um, is, uh, is protected by being in the National Marine Sanctuary. Um, to a certain extent, um, what we've learned over the last um, the last 16 years of, of studying her is that despite um, the fact that she's in a sanctuary, she's still being impacted by uh, mostly by uh, fishing gear. And um, we realize that that's a, a problem that we have to address. And we are doing that with our fishing partners and with fishermen themselves by looking at what potential solutions there are to um, avoiding impacts from uh, commercial fishing gear, which is a danger to the fishermen themselves and they don't wanna lose their expensive gear on a wreck like uh, the Portland. Um, and it's also a danger to the wreck uh, and, and helps uh, further the degradation process when it gets hit uh, by fishing gear. So, um, uh, our, our policy right now is not to disclose where historic resources are in the interest of trying to protect them from people that might want to loot them, but that may be not the best solution uh, when you're trying to uh, protect the wreck from, from fishing gear. So we are uh, struggling with this and, uh, and we're moving towards a solution, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely a tough problem to solve. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for that great explanation. We are going to take one final question, and this one is going to be for Kelvin. I've personally loved all of the stories that he shares about artifacts, and we have a viewer that's asked a question. If, did you see any artifacts on the wreck that really made an impact on you personally? It's a really, really good question. There's, there's quite a bit of them, but I think in part for me, I have a context of, um, of speaking with some of the people, uh, descendants. And so that the one that I mentioned earlier about the, um, the, the warming stove as it sat there in place where um, the dishes were still there. Now the wreck might have come down gently, but there's this care and this... Uh, craftsmanship in, in the industry, in, in people doing their jobs well and continuing to, um, you can see here some of the plates and bowls uh, on the screen. And my favorite is those intimate parts because I wonder, you know, those were the, the dishes that they had for their final meal that were put away and, and how that works. So one of my jobs is, you know, going around and taking and looking at everything as a whole, but when you when you look at it, it's those small things that I look at and I use, and then I see my family using, and I wonder just the impacts that had beyond. And so those are testaments, and they're in, um, in small things are uh, big stories. And so it's, it's in that that really hits. Thank you so much, Kelvin, for that, sharing that personal moment and for your storytelling about the new, tr the new life of the tragedy of the Portland. And with that, I want to let you all know that we will be streaming live tomorrow with a program about a mystery schooner in Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. 
Now those programs are at 2.30 and 6.30 p.m. Eastern. And we also will be tuning in about the Mystery Schooner again on Thursday at 2.30 p.m. I want to thank all of you viewers for tuning in today, asking such fantastic questions and participating in a live exploration of Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. I wanna thank the research team at Situate for contributing all of their knowledge to address all of your questions and for making this expedition possible. I wanna also thank the Inner Space Center for making this production and bringing all of this to you possible. And again, to the Catapult team who's out braving the storms in Massachusetts Bay right now to bring you live remotely operated vehicle video feed. With that, if you are interested in learning more about this project and today's program, you can check out either the NOAA's Sanctuaries page or the Woods Hole page to find more about this project. Links are located on the screen now. And also, if you wanna follow along on social media, all of our accounts will be posting about it today and throughout the week with the hashtag Stellwagon Deep Dive. I again wanna thank you for tuning in and I hope you get to see another program, maybe checking out Mystery Schooner tomorrow or Thursday. Thanks everybody.